Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Future of Stablecoins, co-hosted by the Chamber of Digital Commerce and Armanino. I'm Perry and Boring, the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We are the world's leading trade association in the blockchain industry, representing over 200 companies across the ecosystem. Our mission is to promote the acceptance and use of digital assets and to fight for a predictable legal environment for businesses innovating with blockchain technologies. Today, we are joined by some of the industry's top thinkers and operators of stablecoin networks from the Digital Dollar Project, uh, Circle, Trust Token, and Paxos. Each of our speakers will be interviewed for about 20 minutes, and we invite all of you to join us in the discussion by submitting your questions in the Q&A function through the Zoom webinar feature at the bottom of your screen. Next, I'd like to introduce our co-host, Noah Buxton of Armenino. Thank you, Perry Ann. Uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you to the Digital Chamber for making this possible. Uh, some of you have uh, no doubt made it here through uh, sort of the hashing it out um, uh, series. And so uh, we consider this also a special edition of hashing it out. We appreciate you uh, following Arminino's hashing it out and we're looking forward to another um, exciting and thought provoking discussion today. Um, and in the spirit of hashing it out, it's really all about community conversation and participation. There is a huge group I've seen flood in. We can't take uh, video questions today given the size of the group. Uh, however, we do invite you to uh, use the Q&A feature. So please bring your questions and we'll try and pick them up as we go. I think your questions might be the most relevant here today. So with that, I'm your host, Noah Buxton. Um, I am a reformed attorney with a background in risk assurance, um, and, and IT, and, and sorry to all the attorneys to say I'm reformed, but uh, I do love what I do every day. Um, I'm lucky enough to put my experience and my passion to work really in a very hands-on way. So I get to lead our blockchain practice here at Armenino. I get to act as a subject matter expert for our digital asset clients, and I get to product manage and build the new assurance technology solutions that we're building for this space. Uh, for those that don't know the Armenino name, briefly let me tell you, we are a top 25 public accounting firm um, we're the largest headquartered in California, and we service clients nationally and internationally with about 1,300 uh, Armenino folks. We also have a specialized industry practice. We've been serving leading names in the crypto and blockchain space since 2014. Uh, and as I said, we build new solutions for this space. So we have an innovative focus, and one of our goals every day is to fill gaps um, that we see in the space. <clears throat> so... Uh, for those of you on the call that I haven't met yet, I look forward to the chance to connect. Um, my team and I have been working in stable coins uh, since about mid 2018. And I have to say I'm extremely energized by the growth that I've seen in this space in the past two years, and even, wow, just the past few months. Uh, for those of you on the call that are following this closely, you know that uh, the past couple months have been uh, very interesting for this space. Uh, I wouldn't say stablecoins are quite yet a household name, but I think the stats do speak for themselves. Uh, you know, over the past two years, we've essentially seen a 10x growth in stablecoin market cap, uh, and the daily trade volumes or daily volumes of uh, stablecoin activity are really impressive. You know, um, they've uh, they've gone from uh, pretty low numbers to about 20 billion today uh, on an average day, and they've actually doubled. Um, uh, the, the market cap has doubled in the last. Uh, three months. So the upward trend is clear. I think the real question is, wow, where does this take us? Um, and so that's why we have uh, great thinkers and uh, stablecoin operators here uh, joining us today. And I really want to get into the future. So the last thing I want to say before introducing our first guest is uh, maybe just a quick uh, stablecoin 101. I want to give um, our, our thought leaders here the chance to dive right into the meaty topics without having to explain stablecoin 101. So for those of you who have joined us uh, where this concept is a little bit new, what, uh, what is a stable coin? Um, they are tokens issued on public blockchains. Their overarching purpose is to provide all the benefits of crypto uh, without the volatility, therefore being a more suitable store of value, um, an already accepted unit of account, and theoretically, uh, and I think what we're seeing is in a more improved medium of exchange. There are essentially three types. You've really got fiat backed uh, or fiat collateralized stable coins. You have crypto collateralized stable coins, which are backed up by other cryptocurrencies. 
and you have algorithmic senior age shares type coins, which really aren't backed uh, by anything other than an algorithm that maintains their, um, their stability peg. So there's many different approaches to this. Uh, the, the, the companies and the, the thought leaders that we're talking to today essentially operate fiat collateralized stable coins. And what that means is that their tokens, uh, um, while virtual, are redeemable uh, for real world, real world, excuse me, real world dollars. Um, so with that quick stablecoin 101, um, I'll invite uh, Dan Gorfein. So uh, Dan is founder of Gattic Horizons, a boutique advisory firm, has a long track record um, in think tank, public policy, strategic communications, um, and uh, was a former chief innovation officer, the first chief innovation officer at uh, Lab CFTC. Um, so also serving as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University of Law, uh, teaching fintech law and policy, and most importantly for today, uh, the co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project. So let's jump in. Welcome, Dan. Great. No, it's great to be on. And I should add, Noah, you know, I, I think I'm a reformed or at least a redirected attorney as well. So uh, I'll start with that. That's great. Great minds think alike. So, so Dan, we mentioned that you are uh, co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project. Um, tell us, what is the Digital Dollar Project? Yeah, no, it's good. So, you know, great to join all of you. The Digital Dollar Project is a uh, not-for-profit effort uh, that we launched earlier this year. Um, I did that in partnership with uh, former CFTC chairman, Chris Giancarlo, uh, his brother, Charlie Giancarlo, who's an executive at a tech firm out in the uh, Bay Area. And then uh, David Treat, who's a managing director at Accenture, is one of our partners in the Digital Dollar Project. Um, you know, we can go into a little bit more of the background uh, of the DDP, um, but at its core, it's a, it's a not-for-profit effort focused on exploring tokenization of the U.S. dollar at the government or federal uh, reserve level. Uh, so essentially trying to understand and advocate for the potential benefits of tokenization of the U.S. dollar. Uh, so as you mentioned, we launched uh, earlier this year and just a few weeks ago put out a white paper that goes into a little bit more detail of what a so-called champion model would be for a tokenized U.S. dollar. And, and so what was sort of the, the impetus? Uh, when did these conversations start uh, among the co-founders and, and sort of the people in your network? What was the real impetus for starting this project? So, so you know, you mentioned I was previously at the uh, CFTC, uh, where I was the director of Lab CFTC, their financial technology and innovation uh, office. Um, and, you know, over the years have spent a lot of time meeting with and learning about uh, various types of crypto, blockchain, tokenization type firms and concepts. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that stood out to me, which will be no surprise to anybody on this, uh, joining this meeting, is that, you know, you can send information via an email halfway around the world with very few intermediaries at very low cost. And what I think tokenization, blockchain, crypto, a lot of what this represents is the idea that you can send information about value and unique ownership of value halfway around the world with relatively little friction, fewer intermediaries and at lower cost. And that's pretty profound. I mean, that's gonna eventually impact, I think, the way we transact all types of financial assets and instruments, um, including money and including fiat money. Uh, so, you know, Chris Giancarlo, as many of you have heard from previously, uh, very like-minded and, and certainly has been one talking about the need for the United States in particular to upgrade some of our financial infrastructure. Um, so having left the CFTC, Chris and I are good friends and stayed in touch and talked about these types of issues. And you know, last fall, one of the observations we had is that there didn't seem to yet be kind of a national policy around exploration of how tokenization could impact the U.S. dollar itself. So Chris and I published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, last fall, and you can consider that a bit of a call to action. Uh, we got a lot of really incredible inbound and people interested in the topic, wanting to know what we were gonna do next. This included some of the folks from the Accenture team. I mentioned uh, David Treat, who are also very like-minded. And so one of the things we thought we needed to do after issuing the call to action was think about how can you actually catalyze action? How do you bring together all of the necessary stakeholders and perspectives to have the, the conversation about what it would mean and what the implications are of tokenizing the US dollar, how that ripples through a national economy, the global economy. Um, and so that's a, that, that's, a, that's a difficult topic to work through, but we thought we might be able to create the right platform for doing that. Uh, so that's what drove the launch of the Digital Dollar Project early this year. 
Um, and as I said, you know, the white paper outlines at least our current thinking on the topic and also outlines kind of a set of expectations of what would be next, you know, which would largely be pilots, real world trials so that we can measure the purported benefits of tokenization, um, as well as some of the challenges in, in, in actually implementing that. So, so Dan, what you're talking about, I think, is uh, what we call in the industry a, a centralized, um, a central bank uh, digital currency or CBDC. Is that is that essentially what the digital dollar project is is aiming at? Yeah. So it is focused exactly right on central bank digital currency CBDC. Um, I mean, it might make sense for me to just outline a few key attributes because again, this is a very broad topic, and when you say CBDC. You know, there's a lot of mixed perceptions and ideas out there as to what that would mean in terms of design. Of course, there are a lot of design choices. There are a lot of trade-offs with certain costs or characteristics. Um, but when we talk about CBDC from a digital dollar project perspective, we have a champion model, one that we would like to test against other, you know, designs and other types of payment mechanisms. So the first and I think really important element here is that when we say CBDC, we're talking about actual tokenization of the dollar as opposed to an account space system. There have been some congressional proposals, you know, around Fed accounts, the idea that the Fed could go directly to retail. They may do that through kind of the current account reconciliation process. That's not what we're suggesting as the champion model. Instead, we're, we're suggesting tokenized, actual tokenized central bank liabilities. So the same way you can hold physical cash, which is backed by the full faith and credit and issued by the government, this would be a tokenized dollar with the exact same kind of attributes. The other key characteristic is that we, we believe this should be issued through the existing two-tier banking system, meaning that existing banks and other types of regulated uh, money transmitters, so that would include all of those from the, the, the world of fintech um, and the types of licensing and regulation that they are subject to, would be the, the kind of primary distributor. So it would not be direct central bank to retail, which we don't think would be a wise design choice. Um, instead, largely through the existing two-tiered structure. Uh, we can get into this a little bit more as well. I mean, our champion model presumes that the actual rails would be DLT or blockchain-based. Of course, there's a lot of really thorny questions about how you operationalize that, who serves as validators, but we think that there are privacy and resiliency benefits from that type of structure. And the last thing I would point out, especially relevant to the discussion today, our champion model is not in any way antithetical to private sector innovation and a lot of the developments around stable coins and other crypto assets. In fact, you know, to be totally blunt, we wouldn't be having this conversation today, uh, but for Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin is the reason that people started thinking about, you know, systems, friction, automation, interoperability of networks, and all of the things that are kind of driving the, the back end of, 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 of how money moves. Um, so we view that we view a lot of the private sector innovation to be incredibly relevant and actually help to help inform what would be a public sector driven initiative like a like a tokenized CBDC. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You made three points there that I want to dig into a little bit more. Uh, first, I want to sort of just ask you how far you are along in this project and maybe also note for the audience that uh, Digital Dollar Project has published a white paper. Uh, I think it's worth reading. Um, there's obviously significant thought that has gone into it. Um, you better so, say so that. Go ahead and check it out. <laughs> Google it and download it if you haven't already. Um, but Dan, I mean, when you think of the horizon here of where you guys are going, how sort of how far in are you? Are you just in ideation stage? Uh, I mean, it, it's a great question. Look, it's a massively complicated subject. And you know, one thing during the crisis, you know, there was a lot of concern about how funds were being distributed and, and people started thinking about, well, could a CBDC be helpful? And that it's the right set of questions to be asking, but this is not something that you can implement overnight. I mean, we're talking about the US dollar. It is the reserve currency, or at least the, the current uh, choice global reserve currency. And there, there's a lot that you need to make sure you do right. So. Our view is, is that it is absolutely the right time to be exploring and pursuing a CBDC, but it needs to be done really thoughtfully. Um, and so as a result of that, where we are in the project is that we've published, as you said, the, the white paper It is quite detailed, at least in our current thinking. Now, there are a lot of questions and a lot of open questions, you know, solving for the balance between proper law enforcement needs and privacy is a critical one. Talking about the rails and the governance of the payment system is a critical one. Understanding whether the purported benefits 
are there in different types of applications like retail you know, or domestic uh, payments usage, wholesale, international applications. All of these things need to actually be tested out. So in terms of what this likely looks like, you know, we, we wanted to kind of have this round of discussion around the white paper. From there, what we would suggest is that there be real world pilots and trials so that you actually can measure. I mean, we can talk a lot about this, but until you start testing this in the wild, it's very difficult to really measure the outcomes. Um, obviously, there are some global central banks that are probably a bit further along in that real world piloting or testing phase. Um, so we think that that's really, really important. But look, realistically, you know, are we're you working with any of those. Are you Sorry to interrupt. Are you working with any of those players? Are you are you getting feedback uh, on, on yeah, those we, experiments? We've been, well, I'll, I'll say that you know one of the real benefits of of partnering in, uh, with Accenture is that 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 blockchain team is working with a lot of the global central bank projects. So there's a good, good wealth of expertise there. We also have had the opportunity to speak with many of the other central banks that are working on these projects to learn from them, hear from them. And I also think keeping that line of communication is critical because interoperability is going to be a critical piece of, a, of an ultimate design. You certainly don't want to start creating like these siloed CBDC projects that don't really make sense for a global economy, especially US dollar leadership in a global economy. Um, so all of that is really important. It, look, the time is right now to do this. You know, in our original op-ed, Chris and I referred to this as kind of the, the, the space race or, you know, the, the desire to put a man on the moon um, from many decades ago. And it took over 10 years for that to happen. In the process, it spawned incredible technological innovation and development um, to get to that endpoint. And there's a lot of design and thinking that go, uh, design choices and thinking that goes into success, a successful project like that. And we view this as very similar. It's going to require kind of obviously public sector leadership. At the end of the day, we cannot tokenize the US dollar. I mean, that will be the Federal Reserve in, in conjunction probably with, with other regulators in Congress that would have to make that decision. But the private sector, the way we do things in the US typically is through kind of strong private sector leadership. And that's the same kind of model we think we should be applying here. And, and now it's, it's stupid question time. So uh, what problem does this really solve? If you had to just boil it down to one or two points, what, what, what's the real pain point or the real problem that this solves? This goes back to, I think it's not a rocket science observation, but it's the view that there, if you were to design systems today to move value and information about value and ownership, would you use the same systems that we designed 30 years ago? And the answer is no, because they're gonna be legacy systems, often siloed with many intermediaries and manual processes that are not the most efficient. So if you start with the idea that computers connect and we should be able to move information about value in a very efficient way with fewer intermediaries, then the potential ripple through of the entire global economy of that, that profound point, uh, I think is substantial. So where does it help? It, it, again, I would boil it down to like three broad categories. There's the retail component of this. May this impact individuals seeking to make purchases with a different payment option? maybe merchants and, and vendors who want to receive a competitive source of, of, of payment, perhaps. There's a, maybe an, an access and inclusion aspect here, um, where if the technology and operational costs are lower of this system and digital wallet service providers are able from a tech operational and regulatory perspective, offer a lower cost service than say traditional bank accounts, you should have kind of more ubiquitous access to that type of a wallet service. So perhaps we can pull certain uh, percentages of un or underbanked populations in. That's just the retail side. You've got wholesale payments in markets and the idea that you would have far more efficient financial transactions if you were able to do this with tokenized money. Um, so there's, there's tremendous benefit there. And then of course, at the end of the day, I mean, this is, this is central bank backed money. It is the most risk-free um, uh, fiat currency in the world. So there you could see a lot of kind of international use as well. Uh, then you've got the international kind of remittance aspect of it, which is also a promising channel. Uh, and, and look, at the end of the day, this is, this is again the idea that when it's very hard to predict exactly how this flows through a very dynamic global economy. So I, I assume there are going to be many benefits that we're not even contemplating right now. I know we haven't gone into like the programmability aspect of money, but I think that's another really important aspect. We've only just scratched the surface. <laughs> and uh... yeah. 
That's we have a couple questions that have come through um, the Q&A. Uh, Dan, uh, to, to uh, uh, focus on some of the regulatory aspects and, and the, the policy aspects of this, sure. you mentioned that uh, one, the Digital Dollar Project cannot be the entity that tokenizes the US dollar. The government ultimately has to do this. Um, there seems to have been a bit of a shift in the tone from Fed, Treasury, Congress on the topic of a digital dollar since we've entered into this global um, health pandemic and economic crisis. Can, can you just talk about how conversations have changed over the past several months regarding the digital dollar and the different government entities that you guys are engaging with? Yeah, I mean, the tone has shifted as exactly right. And I, I think, look, I, I think that the crisis underscored areas of weakness in a lot of digital infrastructure. I think digital identity is actually a really big piece of this as well. Um, but leaving that aside, I do think that a lot of things have changed. I'm even going to go back to before the, the pandemic. I mean, you obviously have developments like, like the Libra project. You've had more announcements coming out about the Digital Yuan project. That was at the latter half of last year that there was even more attention focus there. All of these developments, um, I think, have, have gained kind of broader attention from traditional banking sectors, from policymakers, and from Washington in particular. I think the tone of what you've heard has shifted over time as a result of that. I think there are a lot of really good efforts happening in the US. I mean, whether it's organizations like yours, Perry Ann, um, certainly our hope of catalyzing further action through the Digital Dollar Project and a lot of academic efforts. You've seen global papers coming out from Bank of England, BIS, IMF. I mean, a lot of, a lot of thinking going on, and I do think that's gotten people's attention. So what I think is promising is that regardless of the political spectrum, I think a lot of people in Washington see potential benefit through a lot of different lenses. I mean, you can talk about access inclusion, you can talk about the economic role of the US dollar globally, um, all of these things resonate. So, so there has been a shift. Um, you know, I do think government moves slowly and the, the Fed is going to be very cautious and rightfully so. I think what we'd like to see is safe spaces created so that testing and piloting is possible. Um, so I think that that's what, what I, I'd hope to see come out of this period and I would assume that policymakers will increasingly say, even if you're a skeptic, why wouldn't you? Isn't it prudent? Isn't it practical to plan for the possibility that there are real benefits here? And if you're going to do that, you can't just flip a switch five years from now and start issuing a tokenized US dollar. There's a lot of back work that would have to happen. So now is that time. Yeah, we've got time for about one more question. Just to shift gears here on a topic I know um, a lot of chamber members, we've had a lot of conversations at, at the chamber on, uh, but you guys have some very um, interesting approaches uh, to, to the privacy design around central bank digital currency. Uh, how are you guys approaching um, pr privacy fr from the aspect of a digital dollar? The privacy is one of those like key categories that's like its own specific work stream. Um, you know, look, I would say how we're approaching it is with a clear understanding that privacy is one of the things that could give a U.S. dollar, a tokenized U.S. dollar, a certain competitive advantage relative to perhaps other global designs. And privacy is important and expectations around privacy are very important. So we take that very seriously. At the same time, there are going to be appropriate regulatory and law enforcement needs where you do need to satisfy, you know, the existing BSA AML regime. Um, how you balance that, I think the best starting point is to hold the analogy with physical cash. I mean, clearly our system recognizes distinctions between smaller size transactions versus larger size transactions. And I think that's a good starting point. There have been a lot of central banks that have thought about it in that same way. Um, so, so I, 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 you know, that's an area where I think design, it's, it's, it's a policy choice at the end of the day but starting to think about whether smaller transactions may err on the privacy side of the spectrum seems to make good sense. And it's probably most consistent with how people would expect, you know, a US CBDC to be designed. Dan, I realize we're gonna need about four hours for our next session. So thanks for committing to that. We appreciate it. And uh, no, I for appreciate it. I'm looking we... forward to hearing the next presentations. And you know, if I can leave with uh, one final point, you know, the more I've been thinking about tokenized US, the tokenized US dollars, you can think about it almost like a public highway, right? Like the interstate system was created. It impacted certain types of transport businesses, but also created new transport businesses and unleashed a lot of economic activity. I think it's the same thing with tokenized CBDC. I think that the amount of private sector innovation and development that can be built on top of that 
wrapping further programmability uh, around a tokenized dollar um, is really exciting. So I think that that's kind of a segue into some of the next conversations, but that's, that's an area where I think a lot of creativity can be applied. Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate your time today. Awesome. Thanks all. Take care. All right, our next speaker really needs no introduction at all, but I'll, I'll introduce him um, anyways. This is Jeremy O'Leary. He is the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle, one of the early pioneers in the digital currency space. Circle was founded in 2013, and they have pioneered the fiat currency-backed stablecoin USD coin or USDC. USDC is issued by regulated financial institutions. It is backed fully by reserved assets, and it's redeemable on a one-to-one -one basis for U.S. dollars. Uh, USDC is governed by Center, which is a membership-based consortium that sets the technical policy and financial uh, standards for stable coins. And they just announced today a collaboration with the Algorand Foundation. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Noah, back over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, perry -Ann. Thanks, Jeremy, for joining us. Um, so yeah, Jeremy, I think I wanted to jump right in and kind of uh, help the audience understand the lay of the land when it comes to sort of the use cases. So who are the holders and, and who, who's transacting right now in stable coins and what are the, what are the major uh, use cases you see? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's important to, to uh, step back a little bit from it, which is um, if, if you actually read the, um, the center white paper, you know, there was one in 2017 and then when we launched in 2018 an updated white paper, uh, you know, clearly what we're envisioning is a standard set of protocols for fiat value exchange on the internet and not specific to just dollars, but to leading reserve currencies and creating protocols in the same way that we have protocols like HTTP for moving data and content. We have protocols like VOIP for doing things like we're doing right now. Um, and, and these standards exist and they allow for interoperability and global reach. And, and that's really powerful. So we, we clearly saw the need for setting those standards in an open way, in a governed way. And the use cases are designed ultimately to be as broad as, as the use cases of money. And so what would you do with a dollar that is digital? Um, and ultimately that is gonna be every form of transaction, whether it be a person to person transaction, a merchant transaction, a B2B transaction, a, a financial transaction, a securities transaction, any number of um, applications that would benefit from a digital dollar and the ability to use that on the internet our use cases. And so that, that sort of broader vision. Now, when USDC launched in late 2018, um, we've, we thought of it as sort of there's a bootstrap use case, which is sort of who's going to need that today. And, and back in late 2018, it's really driven by um, basically people who understood the benefits of cryptocurrency and who, who needed digital dollars, which were traders. And so a lot of the early phases of stable coins and these digital currency, uh, you know, these fiat digital currencies, were originally created as almost like capital markets infrastructure, so market infrastructure that allowed um, both individuals and institutions to uh, to move value across venues, exchanges, etc. Now that's really started to shift, and so starting in 2019, um, corresponding to the growth of smart contract development, uh, you saw things like USDC increasingly used in combination with smart contract applications such as uh, decentralized finance credit markets. So for example, uh, if you want to uh, borrow or lend, you can access a decentralized credit market, you can supply USDC as collateral, you can borrow in USDC. That's grown pretty dramatically. That's now, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of transactional activity and, and issued USDC that is in those kind of savings lending payments use cases. And then, and then finally, really most notably, uh, over the last, you know, I, I'd call it roughly six months, but it's accelerating we're seeing more and more um, businesses that are realizing that this is just a superior form of payment and settlement um, when you combine uh, you know, a, a full reserve uh, digital asset uh, that is liquid and redeemable with the superpowers of digital, meaning you can transfer it at the speed of the internet uh, in, in with final settlement, with very high levels of security and privacy, with virtually no fees and that can work with anyone anywhere in the world, that's really powerful. And so businesses are starting to adopt it for uh, international transactions, B2B transactions, and, uh, and things like that. Yeah, very interesting. So that goes to some of the future use cases. I like your explanation of, uh, you know, at that higher level, it being well, really any use of money. Um, what do you think um, 
the, the, what's the future use case that you're most excited about? Where do you see this thinking about this, the future of stable coins? You know, in, whether it's three, five years or, or longer, what's the, the, the most, uh, the use case that you're most excited about? Sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when we got started in, in, the, in this problem space, in the digital currency space uh, in 2013, I think, um, you know, my background's not in the financial sector. My background's really in building internet platforms and software platforms, content platforms, media platforms. And I think it's been interesting to watch over the past, um, you know, 20 to 30 years as these open networks and protocols make it possible to uh, do things that in the past cost money or had time delays or, or, or were kind of um, uh, in closed loop ecosystems. And, and really moving to an open internet model really dramatically changed what became possible and radically changed the unit economics of those things, whether it's we now have instant free global communications, we now have uh, access to all the world's knowledge instantly at no cost. Uh, these are really powerful benefits of these open networks. And so I, I think from our perspective, um, when, I, when I think about three to five years out, I think that these standards and these kinds of stable coins um, you know, in many respects, we'll just make moving value a commodity free service on the internet. And we'll look back in the same way that we look back at long distance telephone calls or the way we look back at snail mail or the way we look back at how information was published in catalogs and proprietary databases. Um, and we'll look back at, at money transmission and we'll say, I can't believe that people actually paid something to collect or make a payment. It'll just be a commodity free service on the internet. And so I think we're, we're on a path towards that. And, and that will um, increase the volume of transactions in the world. It will, it will allow, allow billions of people to participate more freely in those types of transactions. And then the really exciting thing is when you combine these digital currency assets with the programmability that comes with these public networks as well. And we've just never had a world where, uh, you know, what I like to call money is a native data type on the internet. Uh, when money becomes a native data type on the internet, people, developers, engineers, creative problem solvers can innovate around it and do really exciting things. And so um, blockchains are interesting because they provide this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of permissionless, secure, global, interoperable transaction settlement medium. But they're also interesting, and in particular, sort of second generation blockchains and now third generation blockchains is because they're also distributed computing engines. They provide a tamper proof, uh, nation state attack resistant uh, surface area for executing code and contracts. And so what I'm interested in is how do we start thinking about economic contracts differently globally? How does a, a laborer in a, uh, a, a, you know, another part of the world in, in India or in Venezuela or in uh, you know, Korea contract with another service that's somewhere else in the world and move value and intermediate that through, um, through code? that is enforced by machines. And so smart contract based economic contracting that builds on this uh, basically commodity free service of moving value, I think it's where the really interesting things start to happen. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. The, the programmability of money um, it has incredible, incredible potential. That's, that's even hard to measure today. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I use the analogy of, um, you know, that there's a lot of times you have these convergences of technologies and you don't actually, you don't see what's possible. You know, for example, you know, uh, the iPhone came out and, you know, the first version didn't have an app store and, and it was on the slow internet networks. And then, you know, they'd introduce a new version. It had 3G. So it was a little bit faster and it had an app store so people could create things for it. And it also had a GPS built in and people thought, oh, GPS, that's neat. I'm going to be able to get directions. But what people didn't realize is when you combine those three things together, you could revolutionize a logistics and transportation industries and build platforms like Uber and have just tremendous value creation and open up entirely new labor markets and change things. I think the same thing today about public blockchains, stable coins, and smart contracts. The synthesis of those, when you start to innovate with them, we don't know what people are going to create. I mean, Compound is a really fascinating example. It's a recent one that's sort of exploding, which is people determined you could create a credit market that doesn't have an intermediary. That's, that was inconceivable just uh, a few years ago. And so what are people gonna be able to create with this? Um, we, we don't know, but I think it is gonna be uh, very significant. Are, are fiat collateralized stable coins, uh, are they the end state or are they an intermediary step towards sort of this digital uh, future that we're talking about, programmable money? Uh, is it the end state or, or an intermediate step? 
Yeah, you know, um, I'm very much of the view that uh, I'm I'm what I like to call an internet maximalist. <laughs> there's you know Bitcoin maximalists. There's <laughs> Uh, you know, various maximalists. I'm an internet maximalist. And, and what, what that means is I believe that a, a greater and greater amount of how society and the economy and, and organizations themselves function is going to be um, operated, you know, natively on the internet. And I include things like courts and law and other stuff, I think will ultimately move to, to those realms. And I think because of that, um, we're, ent- we're going to be entering a period where, in particular, when you think about digital currency, you know, a, a digital RMB uh, that is uh, a liability of the Central Bank of China um, that exists on the Internet, it exists everywhere at once. It exists intergalactically. It just exists wherever the Internet exists. And so money has the reach of the Internet instantly. There, the, the Internet doesn't care about borders. And any person or business or country that wants to transact with China will be able to do that directly over the internet. And that's really profound. It's profound for every global economy. But I think what that ultimately is going to lead to is, um, you know, effectively, we will, we will see the rise of um, the, the sort of most actively used currencies in trade and settlement operating as digital currencies. And ultimately, we'll see synthetic global currencies that uh, emerge from this. And so I, I think we're on a path, an inevitable path towards synthetic global currencies that are, that are built out of the most important trade currencies of the world. And I think we'll operate um, in, in a model like that. And I ultimately believe that those uh, global synthetic digital currencies um, will also have components that are um, made, made up of not just sovereign assets, but non-sovereign a- assets such as Bitcoin as well. Uh, and so in the past, we had, you know, fiat backed by gold, and then you had ratios and, and the like. I, I can imagine a world in the future where you have digital gold uh, in, in ratios to uh, fiat reserve currencies in a basket that creates a new synthetic global currency. I was kind of thinking about the past, too, there for a second with you. Um, and, and I just drew this analogy in my mind. It's almost like the free banking era in a way, uh, you know, maybe some similarities, right? Um, yeah, I mean the inter- innovation on the internet is 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 really profound, and um, and you know uh, to to quote Mark Andreessen, sort of software eats the world. Um, you know now software is eating the financial system and uh, and the global economic system, and the internet is is converging with that, and it's really exciting. And there's a lot to embrace. And I, I would say compared to earlier eras of fintech, um, you know this is quite profoundly different because. You know, there, there are just so many creative entrepreneurs, developers, software engineers that are interested in sort of rebuilding the way that the international monetary system works. This is no longer just the provenance of central bankers. This is no longer just the provenance of, uh, of large banks. Like this is sort of being developed uh, with very broad open source communities around the world. And that's how the internet's been built. It's been built that way for 30 years. This, this sort of uh, uh, you know, collective effort um, to, to build up this infrastructure. It's not a top-down effort. It's very much a bottom-up effort. When you think about uh, maybe your business or, or maybe just sort of this uh, stablecoin industry in general, uh, what do you think are the biggest impediments to making this uh, more mainstream, more widely adopted? Like you said, used, used by enterprises, uh, yeah. used in retail transactions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a few things. I think um, there, are, there are technology barriers um, for sure, but I think we're, we're very, very close to, re- to resolving um, some of the most important ones. So some of those have to do with sort of how do you create a, a user experience at the end user level, which is really straightforward. Like, you know, back in the early days of the internet, like you had to know things like how to type in like protocols and all this stuff in, into web browsers and, and using email was a lot more complicated. And, um, and then you, you had services and browsers and search engines and other things that abstracted that. And I think we're very close to that in this digital currency world. We're, I think, literally you know, months or quarters away from really seeing some breakthroughs on the user experience side of things. The other sort of technical impediment is um, you know, we're, we're very much in need of third generation blockchain infrastructure in particular, public blockchain infrastructure, because we want to build systems that are resilient and, and interoperable globally. And the only way to do that is on the public internet. So third generation public blockchain infrastructures that can support hundreds of millions and, and then through other techniques, even billions of users. I think we're also very close to seeing that infrastructure um, coming, coming to the market. And 
uh, that's that's very exciting. But I think the other piece when is you say, when you say third gen. Sorry, just for our users to break break that down really quickly. When you say third gen blockchains, what are you referring to? Yeah. So um, you know, effectively, you you had the sort of first generation, which were you know sort of single purpose blockchains, like for just a single token, like like Bitcoin. You had second generation blockchains that introduced uh, you know concepts like smart contracts and the ability to execute code on these blockchains, but also the ability to issue other tokens and assets, but they had very significant scalability limitations. Um, and then third generation are, are really trying to address the scalability limitations of the second generation blockchains. And they're also, you know, I think building in um, underlying kind of primitives or building blocks that are, are really, you know, I think useful to say global financial applications. And so those third generation chains, I would include Ethereum 2 as a third generation blockchain. I would include the Libra network blockchain as a third generation blockchain. Platforms like Algorand, which uh, we just announced uh, we're, we're bringing stable coins to with, with something powered by USDC as well. Um, and there are others uh, that, are, that are emerging um, are, are really key to that, um, really key to that. And those are like operating systems and they just get faster and better or like the addition of broadband to the internet. They just try to increase the capacity. Um, the, the third piece though is, uh, is regulatory clarity. And so uh, I think one of the most important um, sort of uh, you know, work streams happening right now is the Financial Stability Board's work stream around establishing G20 wide regulatory frameworks for global stable coins. And so um, the, the key thing is that the, the, the biggest uh, you know, uh, financial regulators in the world all agree that global stable coins are here they're arriving, they're going to grow. And that's quite distinct from central bank digital currency projects. We're talking about private sector led initiatives like Center Consortium, Libra Association and other private sector actors. These are here and they're growing and they're going to get bigger and bigger. And there has to be uh, rules of the road, you know, financial institutions, corporations, and then ultimately individuals that depend on those corporations and financial institutions are going, are going to want to know that you know, this operates with, with rules of the road. And I think um, the, the policy recommendations that are coming out and which will ultimately come into effect through legislative initiatives around the world in 2021 are gonna be really key to really opening this up for billions of people. Yeah, the regulatory side of things is certainly important. And, and just so you're aware, and so other folks are, are too, the chamber is uh, preparing comments to the Financial Stability Board. Um, I'll be sharing information at the end of the call on that. But Jeremy, we'd love for you to be a part of those conversations as we're putting together our, our, our thoughts and, and our, our policy positions to the FSB and the Bank for International Settlements. Um, we're getting a number of questions for you. I'll, I'll try to get um, a few of these in before we're up for time. Sure. Uh, there was a big announcement, or not really announcement, but PayPal has been in the news this week. They haven't officially made an announcement, but there's some rumors from credible sources. They have over 325 million users. Just overall thoughts on, on, on this rumor. You know, how, how do you think uh, you know, PayPal being crypto enabled is gonna impact uh, cryptocurrencies and stable coins? So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really exciting. Um, obviously, you know, it's not confirmed, um, uh, but I, I, think, I think it's really exciting. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when, when you think about, um, you know, when, when the crypto industry really got started, um, th th there was a lot of like, hey, we're going to build something where you don't actually even need PayPal. Um, like PayPal was sort of the first generation of, of kind of how this worked. And the PayPal uh, without PayPal. Sorry? It's the PayPal without PayPal. Right, right, and and I th I think our view um, is is a little bit more nuanced, which is that there are digital wallets. That's uh, it's really uh, digital wallets are at the forefront of the future of consumer finance. So products like Square Cash, products like Venmo, products like Revolut, and then it, all around the world, you know, Tencent, Alipay. These are the forefront of retail finance. It's not banks, and so all of those platforms are gonna support cryptocurrency. All of those platforms are gonna support stable coins and are gonna provide interoperability. And just like I can send an email if I use Gmail and you, you use Yahoo and someone else uses Baidu in China, we can all communicate with each other. We have interoperability because of standards. I think that um, uh, you will see the leading digital wallets adopting standard protocols for doing say dollar-based transaction settlement on the internet. Um, and I think that that's gonna happen, uh, you know, obviously, um, Libra Association's driving some initiatives there. Uh, what Center Consortiums do is driving some initiatives there. And I think you'll see more of that. And, and having major players like uh, 
PayPal, you know, getting into this industry is, is, is really great news and, uh, and certainly, um, you know, demonstrates that in the next year, you know, we're, we're going to see much, much broader mainstream adoption and use of, of cryptocurrencies. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a, an on-ramp for, for retail, just make it more easy and more accessible to, to on-ramp into the crypto ecosystem. Um, we, we got a, a question on, on a regulatory topic. Uh, Circle was the first company to receive a bit license from the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, and the question is, is, is kind of around how uh, DFS requires stablecoin issuers uh, to either freeze, forfeit, or seize uh, stablecoins um, themselves in addition to the currency that's backing them. Uh, general thoughts on th those requirements and if it's incompatible to the practices to traditional banks um, and is the, the standard being held to crypto products and crypto companies uh, higher uh, than, than traditional banks and financial institutions? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question um, and, it, and, and it raises a lot of issues. And so, um, so C Center Consortium, for example, um, defines and the, and the technical specifications of USDC do include a blacklisting feature, which is specifically um, used in a scenario where a, you know, a, a, a U.S. court of competent jurisdiction with a, uh, an appropriate court order could uh, freeze uh, assets uh, that exist. Um, so that is, that is something that is a regulatory requirement um, and that does exist, that, that capability does exist. Um, I think um, w this is a new world. We, there's not a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of track record on, on how this is going to be used um, in, in the world. It, it is similar to uh, you know, asset seizures that might take place with a financial institution. Um, so there are there are some similarities there, um, but uh, you know I, I think that that is very much uh, what is in the regulatory you know mandate today, and um, you know the the way in which uh, you know government and law enforcement interact with digital cash is is obviously a new space, and there's going to be a lot of learning and and figuring it out. Absolutely. Uh, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Really appreciate your insights. I uh, love the thoughts on internet uh, maximalist. I, I agree, everything is going digital and we need to upgrade uh, infrastructure and, and, and think about value transfer and, and how we do uh, business and operations um, online and on the internet. Um, always a pleasure. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Perry ann Thanks so much. All right, our next speaker is Rafael Kozman. He's the founder of uh, the co-founder of Trust Token and the maker of True USD. True USD is a stable coin that is fully collateralized by the US dollar. It's re uh, redeemable one for one for the dollar and is trading on over 70 exchanges today. Uh, Rafael leads engineering and product for Trust Token. Uh, he studied computer science at Stanford. He worked at Google Brain before he started Trust Token. And when he is not uh, working, you can find him swimming or reading. Uh, Raf is a native Floridian. Um, I will always join you on the swimming excursions. We appreciate uh, your time um, and joining us uh, today. Thanks, Perry Ann. Appreciate the introduction. Good to be here. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Yep. Cool. Yeah, loud and, loud and clear. So, um, so Raphael, I, I thought it would be really interesting to talk with you uh, about stablecoins, but also about DeFi, because I think there's this really interesting movement in the space and also this, you, this sort of unique intersection between um, the two concepts generally, but uh, the, two, the two mechanisms. So um, maybe we could start there and you could give us the, the DeFi 101. What the heck does DeFi mean? Sure. So DeFi is short for decentralized finance, and um, it includes things like Compound, DYDX, uh, Av, Curve.Fi, uh, Uniswap, um, some of these products that folks here may have heard of or may have used personally. And um, as Jeremy explained, these are systems for financial transactions without intermediaries. So an example is Compound you know, people are doing borrowing and lending directly with a smart contract. So that's a piece of code that's running the blockchain. There's no intermediaries that are holding those funds um, before they can get lent out. You know, putting them directly into the smart contract and the smart contract is directly lending them out. So the reason, part of the reason why it's exciting is because 
it allows for um, less, you know, less trust in the intermediaries. You can just look at the code and you can assess directly. It does what it's, you know, it's supposed to do and um, can hopefully lower the transaction costs a lot by being able to cut out some of those intermediary parties. So I, as I said, there's been a lot of movement in this space. Um, what are some of the headlines re just in recent weeks for DeFi or recent months uh, regarding DeFi that stick out to you? Well, one has been there's been a, a handful of major hacks that have happened and sometimes losing pretty significant amounts of money. And um, you know, some, of the, some of the DeFi platforms that I have named like Compound, um, DYDX and so on have done pretty well and, and stayed clear of these attacks. But there are a couple of others um, like Fulcrum um, that have been hit pretty hard. And you know, once, a, once a platform like that gets uh, gets hacked once, you know, it severely uh, degrades users' trust in that particular platform, but also can degrade users' trust in DeFi in general. I mean, I think one of the benefits of DeFi is that developers everywhere can, you know, create a smart contract, launch it, and people can start using it with real money. But the, the problem with that, the disadvantage is that it, it is much more of a buyer beware situation. And many of these, many of these smart contracts and these uh, companies producing them are not regulated um, or at least are not choosing to submit to any existing regulatory regime. And so they, uh, they could be you know, playing a lot, a lot faster and looser with people's money than you know, a conventional institution that you know, ultimately when people are gonna get sued or go to jail if they do lose people's money. Yeah, there's a couple interesting things there because I think one countervailing point is around the uh, sort of perspective of the user, the willingness to get involved or put stake into something like this, which is essentially an experiment. So I think you would agree in many ways. Very much so. Um, but, you know, even just in the last four months, I think DeFi market caps across these protocols and, and these, you know, sort of options that you'd mentioned, something like 500 million, you know, bouncing around in market cap. And over the past four months, we've tripled. I think today it's something like 1.6 billion is locked up in these contracts. So. And on the one hand, I mean, yes, it's it's absolute peanuts compared to you know eleven trillion in in you know U.S. customer dollar deposits at financial institutions, but it is a significant. Uh, I think it indicates a significant willingness uh, for individuals to to make that sort of gamble that you're talking about or take that risk to experiment with these protocols. So so why do people why why do you think people are interested in in these protocols? Why are people taking that risk? Yeah, part of the reason they're taking the risk is because the rates in DeFi right now are quite good. And the rates in crypto, the interest rates in crypto in general are really good. So um, just to give some examples, um, I mean, right now on Compound, if you go to compound.finance, on Tether, you can earn, you know, four and a half percent APR if you deposit Tether. Um, depending on other cryptocurrencies, sometimes it's five percent or six percent. And that's a pretty great rate compared to you know, the rate on the US dollar, which right now is extremely, extremely low. Um, so we have been seeing both you know, some of the issues with DeFi and hacks, hacks that are happening, but also, as you point out, tremendous amounts of growth. And that's partly because DeFi is, there are some ways in which it's fundamentally more efficient. You know, we, just with very, very low cost, money is able to flow around the globe to wherever it's needed and whoever is willing to pay the most to borrow it. So capital is just flowing from places with low cost of capital to places with high cost of capital much more easily. And that's part of what's creating the, the high rates on DeFi and on crypto in general, the high interest rates that are available. One other thing I think about with DeFi is, um, is it really decentralized? I mean, it is insofar as the protocol can operate in a distributed way, right, on a blockchain. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, right, on this sort of 2.0 or 3.0 version where you have a, a, you know, virtual machine essentially that runs across the blockchain. Um, but then again, they are, they are a company, right, where they are a group of individuals um, who come together to build the protocol and maintain it. So, um, what do you think about that? I mean, is it really decentralized? I, I guess I asked you that because um, you said they're sort of maybe unregulated or there's some open questions for regulation of DeFi. And I, I thought, well, are they really decentralized? So, so what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I'd say to varying extents. So, you know, like Bitcoin is is potentially one of the most deregulated and one of the most uh, decentralized blockchains. You know, Ethereum still has Vitalik and the Ethereum Foundation, which do, is, do ex you know, exert a certain amount of control. And that does allow Ethereum to change more quickly than it could otherwise. But it also, you know, could, could create risk if uh, you disagree with what some of those more centralized actors are doing. So similarly with DeFi, you know, you can have smart contracts out there where there's literally no one who has control of it and who could upgrade it or change it. And that is a benefit, but it also could be a downside because that means that, you know, that it'll never receive security patches or updates or improvements in the system. So it's, it's, it's very much um, on a case by case basis, how decentralized these things are. We're right now, um, we just recently launched a product called True Rewards that's in a closed beta right now that's meant to make it easy for users to get access to DeFi, things like AV, Compound, DYDX, and so on, and easily be able to just look at the different options and select between them. And um, it, there, there is right now a lot of variety and uh, you know, users do have to really think about which one um, they wanna trust. And there are, as oftentimes, you know, millions and millions of dollars on the line. So I think Compound today has about you know, 870 billion, not no, billion, sorry, million dollars, 870 million dollars. That's a pretty significant amount of money. And um, it's because, you know, users have looked at this smart contract and they trust it. And other platforms have less, uh, some platforms have more. It's very much um, based on just what, what are users choosing to trust with their funds. Do you see stable coins as sort of a, a necessary ingredient in the recipe of DeFi uh, or is it bake your own cake? I mean, how do, I see that there's an intersection, but are they necessary in that ecosystem? Uh, yeah, I think that they're very necessary. And I think actually part of the reason why the DeFi is exploding right now in, in usage is because of stable coins. It, they're really going hand in hand because earning but, you know, a lot of DeFi, what's interesting about it is that, so there's, there is a wave of, of crypto, you know, it's 2017 and, and before that, which was a lot of folks coming in to buy equity-like products, you know, things that could go up 100x, you know, you buy some token, whether that's Bitcoin or whether that's a quote unquote shit coin, and it could go up 10x or 100x, it could crash to nothing. And those are the types of pr products that people are buying. And at least for at least for some um, period of time, you know, that, that, that portfolio of products seemed very attractive and, and some, some people still think it's today very attractive, um, but uh, it, was, it was certainly extremely high risk. And we're now seeing a shift towards um, debt-like products, um, you know, interest-bearing assets, where it's not gonna 10X or 100X, but you could earn a steady 3%, 4%, 5%, sometimes even 8% or 10% per year and that's very attractive compared to what's available on most fiat currencies today. So that shift is starting to bring in, it's starting to attract into crypto folks that are looking for, that are not quite uh, so speculative, are looking for you know, more steady returns and they're willing, to, they're willing to take some risk. I mean, these certainly aren't FDIC insured bank accounts. They are higher risk, but they aren't the level of risk of when you just buy a cryptocurrency that could go up or down by 10X. So that's part of what this market is appealing to, and we're and we're seeing a lot of money flood in. And it's it, it's not that interesting. It's not nearly as interesting to earn to earn a high interest rate on an already extremely volatile cryptocurrency. I mean, there's there is a market for that, but you already you know the vast majority of your upside or downside is determined by the cryptocurrency, like if that's Ethereum or Bitcoin or something else. You know, so getting five percent on your Ethereum, well, you're probably gonna, Ethereum could five x or go down by five x while you're earning that five percent. Um, yeah. But you know, earning earning an attractive interest rate on a stable coin, that's really interesting. And um, if it's secure enough, that could be you know that could be a huge product with not just you know hundreds of millions of dollars, but in the future, hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars. One thought that comes to mind is uh, is to say to the audience that. Um, I find, uh, I know we have a varied audience. We have very technical users. We have co-founders of companies and CEOs, and we've got all the other, on the other side, attorneys and uh, you know, those with a regulatory mindset. Um, yeah. I would say for the, the sort of 
the latter and the middle group that it's super important to try this stuff, to just put your hands on it and see how it feels. Because it's one thing to theoretically say, wow, look at this sort of risk reward calculations going on. Aren't there consumer protection issues? You know, uh, you know, if we're talking about personal finance and putting into this smart contract and this hard to understand new experiment, um, but you should try it because uh, you will, um, you will learn for yourself. Uh, you will, you'll see these things in, in, in real life. Um, so I did that. I spent last weekend playing a lot with DeFi, put a nominal Great. amount of money in and just uh, moving things here and there, seeing how I can expose a wallet, you know, to these given platforms. And um, it's, it, it's pretty compelling stuff, honestly. I think it's very, very early, but pretty compelling. Um, so into a question real quick. Um, one of the things you mentioned was was these vulnerabilities. And um, I think that first off, we can say that current financial system has vulnerabilities, current financial technology has vulnerabilities. So it's not unique sure. to DeFi exactly, but what but some of the ways that it is vulnerable are kind of unique. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about so what are the big buckets of vulnerabilities right now um, for these these types of protocols? Yeah, so the so in terms of just recent attacks that have happened and vulnerabilities that are most common, um, I mean, there's just technical bugs. You know, one of the issues is that the, it, you know, what's actually running on blockchains like Ethereum is EVM bytecode, Ethereum virtual machine bytecode. It's a low level language similar to how assembly, assembly is running on your computer. And while programmers are writing High level in a high level programming language like Solidity or Viper, it's ultimately compiling down to bytecode. And whether your program is secure or not depends on that bytecode. And so, um, you know, in, in, unless you do, unless you very rigorously, t you know, are testing your code um, and are doing potentially even formal verification where you're, you're mathematically proving certain properties of your compiled code, it's, it's very difficult to know, even if you work with professional auditing firms if you're truly pushing something that is secure. And when you're doing normal development of like backend code, you know, if you're, if you're just building a, a web server or something else, if we're, not, if we're not working on the blockchain, then you can actually get away with a lot more because if you have a bug or you have 10 bugs, there's still a good chance that they won't be found because there aren't people that are looking over your code in tremendous detail trying to find those bugs from by and large. But when you're writing code for the blockchain, you know, you've got both a, you know, a huge number of people and also machines that are scanning every single piece of your compiled code looking for any vulnerability. And there's oftentimes you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on the line. So they're very incentivized to find any issues. And so your probability of, having an, of actually having an attack if you do ship a bug is much closer to 100%. And then there's, in addition to those technical issues, there's also um, just the financial issues of um, people using price manipulation to create attacks. So there's a recent attack on a product called Fulcrum where part of the attack, it was a fairly sophisticated attack, and part of it was doing price manipulation of a decentralized exchange. So when you have smart contracts um, that are doing uh, borrowing and lending, things like Compound, DYDX, and so on, oftentimes they need to know the prices of various assets, whether that's a stable coin like TrueUSD or it's Ether or it's something else. And they need to get that from some data source. And that's oftentimes an on-chain decentralized exchange where people can actually you know, transact TrueUSD versus Ether or USDC versus Ether. But the issue is that someone can, in the course of a single transaction, they could sell you know, $5 million of Ether onto that exchange, significantly bringing down the price, especially because a lot of these decentralized exchanges have lower liquidity than centralized exchanges like Binance, OKX, and so on. So you could do a, you could do a large sale or a large purchase, significantly changing the price, then go and take out a loan or, or make a loan, you know, interact with a decentralized market that's doing lending. And that market might, might be, if they're pulling the price feed from that uh, decentralized exchange, they might be, it might be confused and think that the price is something other than what it really is. When you, you have just temporarily manipulated it in order to take a certain action, um, whether it's paying back a loan or taking out a loan, and then eventually the price will correct. But at that point, it could be too late because you know, the decentralized exchange might have already made you a big loan thinking that your collateral was worth a lot more than it actually is. So these are the types of attacks that we're seeing, um, both technical and sort of financial attacks. 
uh, and uh, you know, the best practices are still very much emerging. So it's it's not it's not clear, you know, even for some of the most trusted products on the market, um, how really how safe they are. Yeah, Raphael, you mentioned a lot of the the, the challenges uh, to DeFi, and, and one of the ones that that we see is just the mass adoption. H how do we reduce the complexity of these projects for the average user? Um, while uh, you know, me, you, and and many of our members uh, certainly can, can can navigate through the, the, these challenges and. Um, uh, you use the technology, the, the average person, that, that learning curve is quite complex and in order to, to make this ready for, for mainstream. How do we address the, the complexities in the DeFi space? Yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the biggest issues that we're seeing. And so we're actually, we're working on a product to address that. And the goal of this, this product that we were just recently released, it's now, it's in closed beta, should be an open beta soon. Um, but the idea is basically, to allow you to access DeFi from directly within a stable coin. So you could be holding, let's say 100 true USD in your wallet and then say, okay, I wanna use um, AV or I wanna use Compound or DYDX or another, uh, another one of these platforms. You just flip a switch and then your stable coin balance in your wallet will just start increasing as you get rewards from that DeFi platform. And um, then you can say, okay, well, I'm, I'm done. I wanna opt out of this. And then you know you'll just have normal normal true USD again, not earning any rewards over time, and you know just just uh, totally safe. And so just making it really easy and seamless to opt in and out, and not having to go learn about five different platforms, but be able to just say, okay, I want to opt into this one, and you immediately start getting rewards coming into your wallet. That, that solves some of the usability issue that you're asking about, but there's still a risk issue, which is that users have to actually be able to assess these platforms, and so. We're working on a, a something for that, which is around called trust token assurance, which is basically a risk market for DeFi and, and but then in the future, CeFi uh, financial opportunities. So basically having experts that are able to go and assess these platforms and provide what's, what's sort of like insurance for the platforms themselves saying, hey, I'm willing to put up, let's say a million dollars saying, I think Av, Av is one of the partners that we work with. They're a, a major decentralized market um, for borrowing and lending. You know, someone, can, someone can put a million dollars and say, I think that Av is very trustworthy. I've looked at the code. I've looked at how, they're, how, how, you know, how they get their price feeds for their um, prices of the assets they trade. And I think everything's very solid. And I'm going to put a million dollars and I'll take the first loss if they end up having any issues. So I'm, I'm going to take the loss before any of the normal depositors. This is sort of you know, experts or companies that are, that are in the business of providing this kind of assessment that can provide that assurance to end users. And then end users won't have to do a, a kind of you know, deep technical assessment that's really infeasible for the, for the vast majority of DeFi users, but they'll be able to have that source of information knowing that something is already assured. Great. Well, uh, so certainly uh, share your enthusiasm. I, I think there's so much promise within DeFi and the future of stable coins and the future of, of monetary policy and, and the global financial system. And going back to Jeremy's ideas of being an internet maximalist on how we transfer value instantaneously um, around the world. I appreciate you sharing uh, your, your thoughts and insights and also how uh, Trust Token is ap appreciating this. Uh, no, appreciate your time. All right, Ra Raphael, appreciate your time. Um, Thank next you. We'll, we'll introduce our, our next speaker. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, man. Thanks. All right, and our uh, fourth but but uh, uh, most anticipated speaker, Walter Hessert. He's uh, the head of corporate strategy at Paxos. Uh, Paxos operates Paxos uh, Standard or Pax. Uh, that's a digital dollar that can move anywhere in the world, any time of day. It's programmable. It's backed one to one for the dollar, um, and was issued uh, by Pax trust company or the Paxos trust company. Um, so that, that provides an audited regulated structure for their digital asset. Um, Paxos shares a vision of a frictionless global economy where all assets um, can move around the world instantaneously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Walter, thanks for joining us to share your thoughts on this. Thanks a lot, Perry Ann. Thanks for uh, having us on. Thanks for being here, Walter. You know, I, when I was preparing for this, um, which is a little bit like writing a book report while the author is still writing, by the way, um, a little bit difficult because there's so much going on. Um, 
I realized that uh, PAX actually got its start a lot, or PAX as a, as a company got its start a lot earlier than I realized. I don't know if people know that, but I think you guys really started this project in about 2012. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the interesting things that you're a, you're a strategy guy, so I kind of wanted to think about the future of stable coins and from a strategy perspective, sort of operating models and um, and get your insights sort of in that perspective. So one of the things that that PAX does is, you, I guess you could say you've sort of vertically integrated. Um, can you explain how PAX as a token and Paxos as a company and, and then Paxos as a trust company and how that all works together? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's helpful to uh, step back to your point. Uh, there's there's quite some history to Paxos as a company. We launched ITBIT in 2012. We were the first regulated uh, exchange to launch in the U.S. in 2015, and uh, we got our trust uh, charter uh, in 2015 as well. And um, and and obviously many developments since then. And just the purpose of of Paxos or our mission at uh, Paxos is uh, to create a more open um, and accessible financial system. And we're doing that by building and creating highly regulated financial market infrastructure. And that's why we set ourselves up as a trust company. Really, this, and this predates me um, by some years, but that was really uh, the vision of, of Chad, our founder, that as a trust company, we could have the highest level of oversight to hold people's assets. And in holding our clients' assets, and by the way, that's all types of assets, so not just crypto, but also cash, which powers there, which is the asset underlying our stable coin and commodities and securities, we're then able to enable them into blockchain environment. And in that way, we're able to serve as this gateway between traditional and digital assets. Uh, and so that's what we've been building, and we're, we're really excited about that mission, and we're really excited about all the progress we've made to date, and probably most excited about all of the movement that's happening now. Uh, when we think about PAX, PAX was uh, launched at the end of 2018, and it was our, uh, our first stable coin. It was the first asset we issued. It was the first regulated um, and the regulatory approved uh, issued asset uh, in the U.S. And, and maybe in the world. And um, it, uh, it, it, it served as a, an important step, I think, in the evolution of what we've seen in the in the stablecoin industry, where you had uh, Tether start to proliferate and really start to grow and has continued to do so today. And then you saw the introduction of some stablecoins that that moved the conversation along to build a stable coin that was more transparent and potentially maybe even more usable outside of what was the main use case that Jeremy spoke about earlier from the early days, which was crypto trading. And they did that through like really kind of innovative products, certainly like attestation, some of the stuff that you guys have built at Arduino. And uh, we then took it uh, to the next level by going out and getting the, the highest level of regulatory oversight and actually approval from our regulators and oversight in the issuance so that they actually oversee the issuance. And, uh, you know, we still think that, 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 that that's certainly, uh, we're, we're happy that we approached it that way um, as the conversations for CBDCs uh, uh, start to pick up and, and, and maybe more importantly and more near term, some of these really large non-crypto companies start to look at stablecoin and start to figure out the types of stablecoin products that they want to launch to their customers. Uh, in 2019, we launched uh, two other Paxos-powered stablecoins uh, as part of our stablecoin as a service. Uh, some call them white label stablecoins, which they, they, they look like in some ways. And these were stablecoins with partners. We launched BUSD in partnership with Binance, uh, the Binance dollar and HUSD. And so this was stablecoins that were able to, you know, like Binance, for example, was able to leverage the Paxos infrastructure, our regulatory stack and our tech stack to quickly launch an asset that has the highest level of regulatory oversight with the Binance brand name on it. And so that's been a really key piece of the Paxos stablecoin story and our growth in the stablecoin area. And we'll continue to be as we're um, in the middle of uh, kind of advanced discussions and in some case, even integrations with partners, um, with platform partners for some of the same offerings. It, it seems like, uh, I think it's fair to say the most traction um, in terms of market cap and actual trade volume is in these fiat collateralized models, right? So like a PAX token, like the others we've talked to today. 
Um, and Tether, uh, of course, being the largest market cap uh, coin. Uh, although I think it's still, you know, most agree is an outlier in some ways when we have this conversation about regulated stable coins. Um, is that is that the model for the future? I kind of asked Jeremy this question, but I want to ask it in a slightly different way. Is this um, is this uh, centralized fiat backed one to one model the model for the future, or does that evolve? Does it evolve into something that maybe is not one to one backed, like our sort of retail dollar is today? Um, you know, is it uh, something that's more algorithmic? Is it something that's basketed? What What do you think about that evolution for the future? Well, where it ultimately evolves to is, is a little bit above my pay grade. I would say that, you know, for the, the uh, near term future and the big developments and the new entrants and the new solutions that we're going to see come come about with stablecoin, I'm fairly confident to say that they're going to be one to one backed with, with with fiat currency. And, um, you know, when we get to CBDC and they're backed by, you know, treasury um, uh, uh, bills that your know, treasury notes, that's, you know, that will be a next stage. Uh, but I think that being back one to one by fiat um, is, is, is likely to be the near term future for stablecoin. And it's just because the others, um, uh, a, a multi asset back token is a little bit too big of a puzzle to solve right now, I think. And we saw that with Libra, particularly on the regulatory front, uh, all the backlash that, that, that everyone was um, kind of uh, tuned into here, I'm sure. And so I, I, I think that, you know, even from, from Libra news has come out that they, they've kind of changed their, their vision and the launch plan to maybe uh, a handful of single one-to-one fiat-backed tokens uh, that might be traded into a, um, uh, a kind of like one that basket token. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that that's a pretty good indication that that, that model is here to stay for a while. If I can actually add my uh, monetary policy thoughts on this, um, it, it's really a fascinating discussion to have. To have, uh, you know, with Libra came out with you know proposing that this basket of currencies, but you know a lot of that pushback came from U.S. regulators, and um, it looks like they may be doing a one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar to um, kind of appease concerns from the U.S. perspective. But there's certainly um, other groups that could be completely outside of the United States that, that, that go with a different approach. You know, the IMFs, their, their currency, the, the, the special drawing rights, that's a basket of currencies. Um, and Mark Carney, uh, last year at Jackson Hole, also proposed an alternative to the dollar. That's, that's a basket of currencies. And then it also kind of sounded like that's what Jeremy was alluding to as well when he started talking about synthetic currencies, that, that it, it wouldn't necessarily be one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar. You would have like a global uh, reserve of different assets, whether that's um, you know, a mix of different countries, fiat currencies and or commodities like gold that could be mixed in there. You know, there's no right or wrong answer, but you, you, there is like a very pro proliferation of, of stable coins and crypto assets that are coming into the markets. Um, and you have, in addition to that, you have the sun, you have these international groups like the Bank for International Settlements, the IMF, the World Bank, these, all, they, these groups all provide bank, global banking services. So they, they, they could issue, you know, all sorts of um, different type of, of crypto assets and tokenized products. Then you have the central banks, you know, from the Fed to the People's Bank of China to, to whom else. And then you have commercial banks. Um, you know, JP Morgan Coin is one that, that's, you know, been um, already uh, announced. And, and there's other commercial banks that, that likely will have, um, you know, tokenized versions of, of their um, balance sheets. And then we start getting into these private stable coins. Um, and decentralized um, stable coins. So it's, I think there's like a, a huge world of, of crypto assets that we're seeing, but it's really, we're in the middle of this massive evolution of the monetary system. And I, I think we're in the middle of a big change to, to how uh, financial services um, are gonna look and what money is. And it's probably one of the most important conversations we can ask ourselves today is what is money? Because it's literally changing right in front of us right now. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly, I mean, Perrin, those are great points. I think that um, um, you could, global currency, synthetic currencies seem very possible. I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the network of currencies, the fiat currency is just so strong. I mean, the dollar network is, we, we know the power of networks and it's one of the most powerful networks. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it seems logical and uh, this is why, you know, I think everyone in the industry should be really grateful for groups like the Digital Dollar uh, Project that are really pushing this 
conversation forward on the regulatory uh, uh, side and 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 with uh, the policymakers is that um, you know it's, a, it's an opportunity here for the U.S. and uh, I, I think that it's you know. I'm hopeful that we'll see a global U.S. dollar stablecoin, um, and, and I think it's very likely. Interesting um, recent publication that goes to sort of uh, both of your points is um, a recent Fed paper, I think it was just released on the 20th or something. So I haven't gotten to read the whole thing, and it's full of math equations, so my eyes go across. But um, essentially, they assess this Mark Carney idea. Uh, they assess the, the Libra basket idea. And I think the conclusion in the abstract is pretty interesting. They basically say, you know, they're creating a model for trade shocks and whether this kind of basketed currency makes sense from a global perspective to reduce the impact of those trade shocks on uh, local governments um, and holders of currency, people essentially. Um, and it's like that the overall demand is actually going to be small. While there could be actually really significant welfare increases, uh, that the demand will actually um, not be very large. And so I think that kind of goes to your point, Walter, that um, that maybe this centralized fiat-backed model uh, does win out for a while. It seems to be some some smart people who agree with you. So I'd invite everybody to read it, or at least the abstract. <laughs> So one other quick question for you, we're going to run up on time, but um, I was curious. So one other thing that you're working on is a settlement service and there's some big players involved there, Credit Suisse and a uh, subsidiary of Nomura Bank. I think um, Societe Generale, the French bank. Um, so do stable coins play there or is this really just an equities settlement service on blockchain or is, or do stable coins play a role here for, dividends or uh, purchases or redemptions or anything like that? Well, we certainly think that stable coins, you know, all of the products that we're tokenizing that we, we, we are, you know, custody and tokenizing uh, have, have synergistic aspects to them. And, uh, you know, long-term does dual stable coins play a part in, in tokenizing and settling tokenized securities? Absolutely. Um, you know, today, as you mentioned, we have these like really exciting large financial institutions participating in our pilot as we uh, um, uh, apply for our own, you know, full clearance, uh, clearing agency registration. And I think that when we look across what we're doing in security settlement, what we're doing in gold, what we're doing in dollars, they all are in line with the mission of Paxos, which is um, to uh, allow to create a more open financial system and allow these assets to facilitate the movements of these assets at the speed of the internet. Uh, obviously, today dollars are really critical to allowing that to happen. They're about uh, one side of about 80% of transactions and trades in the world. And so all of the assets that we're tokenizing to facilitate the movement of them, we see regulated stable coins as a key component. Awesome. Thank you for your insight, Walter. Um, I appreciate you bat batting cleanup and hitting Homer for us. Um, it's been, been great, all of our guests. I, I really wish we got to more audience questions. And so as a quick wrap up, let me say that um, I'll write a little something uh, for the audience after and we can distribute it in partnership with the chamber. Just a quick recap um, and maybe to try and get to or demystify some of the questions that were asked here that we didn't get to. So. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody. Thank you for joining. And uh, with that, I'll let I'll let Perry Ann um, uh, put a bow on this. Unless, what do you think, Perry Ann? Do we have a couple of minutes for questions? Uh, I think we're at the top of the hour here, um, but we, okay. we, we've received a few questions in the Q and A that we just we weren't able to get to. So we're going to write those up, and we'll collaborate with the speakers to get the um, uh, 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 responses in writing. Maybe we'll do a blog um, to, to get those out or reach out to you guys in, individually. I uh, want to thank all of our speakers, um, Walter, uh, Raphael, Jeremy, Daniel, um, for joining us. Also want to thank Noah and Arminino for co-hosting today's webinar. Um, if you're listening to this talk and you want to take a deeper dive with us, uh, we want to invite everyone to participate in a couple conversations that we're having at the chamber on these topics. 
Um, we currently have two opportunities to advance the conversation around stable coins and digital payments. Um, one, we're in the process of reviewing the digital dollar projects white paper. Uh, Dan spoke about it at the top of the, the, the webinar. Um, we, we, we're holding a series of meetings um, with our members. We're going over it together as a membership in, in detail. Some of the things we've raised are the role of a digital dollar within the two-tiered banking system within the United States. Uh, we're looking at the benefits and challenges of open versus closed systems, financial inclusion, and privacy uh, considerations. So if you want to participate in those um, uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, and we're also preparing comments to the Financial Stability Board. Uh, Jeremy mentioned this um, when he was talking, but we're, we are writing comments to address the regulatory, supervisory, and the oversight challenges raised by global stablecoin um, arrangements. Um, so if either of those conversations are ones you'd like to participate with us, um, please reach out to Patrick South, um, who uh, leads our uh, member services and development efforts. His email is here on the screen, patrick at digitalchamber.org. And lastly, uh, we also want to invite you to join us for Parallel. That's our virtual event series. Uh, the next episode is scheduled for July 17th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. We'll be joined by the director of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, Ken Blanco, and Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, will be joining us as well. See you guys in July at Parallel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Noah.